it is amazing to me how you can start something and be doing it on a consistent basis, you know, with the Lord and when you're in ministry, just, well, you know, working, doing the hard work, the labor, the time, the energy, the investment, the cost, you know, putting all the pieces together so that we could do what we're doing, you know, sharing about Jesus and talking to people about him and making him known to people that might not otherwise, or maybe they already do know who he is or what he is, and understanding him in a better way. You just don't realize sometimes that when you are in a small type ministry, how challenging sometimes things can be, how the cost or the, the investment of time, the investment of funds, the finances, how much it's going to challenge you. And then on top of that, the spiritual attacks and the ways that things work out. You don't realize that you're actually in a battle until you finally, one day you're kind of like getting hit from the right and the left and you've got an uppercut and you get knocked on your back and then suddenly you kind of roll over and you go, what happened? And that's kind of the way I felt this morning. It was like, man, you know, things were going along pretty good. And this weekend, you know, did a lot of phenomenal, oh, just ministry stuff, like with prophecy update and, you know, the updates that I do with the Last Generation Network News. And everything was just going really cool. And then all of a sudden, you know, kind of my wife and I started having a talk about, you know, cost and finances and how our electric bill is so high. You know, it's been always so high, you know, here. And it's been like, well, you know, we we really, you know, could try to cut back, you know. So, of course, me, I go overboard, you know. I think, well, okay, we'll cut back here and there, and then I'll even cut back on the ministry, you know, shut down the computer at times and make sure that I've got other stuff down, you know, and maybe even cut back on this, that, and the other thing. And then suddenly I get this word, you know, from the Lord. <laughs> it's kind of like one of those, oops, <laughs> maybe I should have prayed against the tide. The oarsman trusting in me does not lean on his oars and drift with the tide trusting to the current. Nay, more often, once I have shown the way, it is against the tide you must direct all your effort. And even when difficulties come, it is by your effort that they will be surmounted. But always strengthen the joy in doing you can have through me. My fishermen disciples did not find the fishes ready on the shore in their nests. I take man's effort and I bless that. I need man's effort. He needs my blessing. This partnership is what means and is my means for success. I began to realize, you know, after I read that, how busted I was because I had cut back on, like, devotionals and I wanted to cut back on, you know, a certain amount of time with, you know, heating the house up because of the computer and, you know, cutting down on energy costs. And, man, I was feeling so bad after I did that that I realized, hey, you know what? So what? Who cares if there's a bill? Who cares if it's a little high? Who cares if we have to cut back, you know? God gave us this opportunity in this last generation to share His Word and gave me a blessing that though I may not be wealthy as others may and I may not, though I may not be famous as others may and I may not, though I may not manipulate or ask for money or be involved in all the you know games and things and all the things that are right for some, I cannot because my dependency has to be always and always has been on the Lord. And if he can't take care of me, frankly, I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. And I kind of thought I was, you know, at first, because I kind of I kind of looked at how the internet was slowing down and people were kind of like going on their summer vacations, which, you know, I don't really do. My wife and I sneak away for a week, you know, and we just kind of like hang out, really. <laughs> we don't do much. Just can't afford it. And so it's been kind of like counting the costs. You know, because it's been a little challenging. And, man, I was getting all kind of like weighted down. Then suddenly, bam, God kind of hit me between the eyes and spoke to me direct. I realized, I have a gift. 
I've been given a blessing from the Lord. I've been given something special. The ability to hear God speak. The knowledge that God communicates. The wisdom that God is real. The unbelievable satisfaction of knowing every day that God talked to me and walks with me. How dare I not use all my last means to put into the ministry of sharing that personally and intimately, Jesus, with anyone, everywhere I can, any way I can, by all means that I can. Oh, I felt so relieved when I realized that, that I had to come out and share. I had to run back to the ministry and say, yes, we'll go for it. We're going on. We're toughing it out. We'll make it. Hi, golly. We may not be wealthy, and we may be poor, but one way or another, God and I, my wife with me, it's an adventure. <laughs> Woohoo! In God's, in video spirit, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit because we can't do things without the power of the Holy Spirit, but we can't do things without the person of the Holy Spirit. We talked about how last week, we may not understand who he is as a person because there's a lot that's really out there that the Bible says that kind of gets a little confusing, but that doesn't mean we abuse the scriptures to make him into something he's not. We don't claim that he's a spirit wing or a spirit wind or a spirit fire or a spirit this or a spirit that. We just say he is part of the Godhead, that he has a personality, he is a person because we know that in the same way that the nature of God is the Godhead, that it's revealed in nature, then so too, the Him being God, He has to be likened unto Jesus. And Jesus is likened unto the Father because Jesus Himself declared, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And we know that God is a Spirit. So with those two things in mind, we know that God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is a person. And likewise, as we begin to study that, we find that there are lots of people that don't believe in that. There are lots of people that want to change that or rearrange it or make it into something it's not. I'll always be honest and truthful when I say, look, the scriptures aren't clear here, but they are clear about this. They aren't clear there. They are clear about this. I'll be honest. When I look at Jesus, I see the Father. When I look at Jesus, I have the perfect image of the Father. Now, I also know that Jesus talks to me. Jesus walks with me. I have a personal relationship with Jesus that's different than I have with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God moves me in my soul lots of times, but it's not only there, for He moves in my spirit and He gives me peace, love, and joy. He communicates to me in ways that I don't completely understand. It's not always audible. Sometimes it's sensory. Sometimes it's perception. Sometimes it's wisdom. Sometimes it's knowledge. Sometimes it's a word. Sometimes it's a gift. Sometimes it's the fruit of the Spirit. But I know this. That Spirit of God is different than the Son. But the Spirit of God always reveals the Son. So if I want to see who the Spirit is, I look to Jesus. If I want to see who God the Father is, I look to Jesus. And even as I look to Jesus, Jesus points to the Father. And even in the same way, the Spirit of God points to Jesus. So if I want to know who He is as a person, all I need to do is look at Jesus. Attack on the Holy Spirit. Many cults attack the personality of the Spirit, just as they attack the deity of Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses are one such cultic group. The leaders of the Watchtower teach that the Holy Spirit is not a person at all, but is merely an essence or an influence. The leader of uh, influence the leaders of the Watchtower teach that the Holy Spirit is not a person at all, but is merely an essence or an influence. And these men say that the Holy Spirit is not really a he, but rather an it. According to them, we shouldn't speak of the Holy Spirit, but of a Holy Spirit. An influence or power emanating from God. No more personal than a breeze flowing through a fan. This is the same error as the early church heresy known as Arianism, so called because its chief exponent was Arius, a priest of Alexandria, 
around A.D. 256 to A.D. 326. Arius taught that the Father alone was truly God. Both the Son and the Spirit were inferior and created. Neither possessed by nature nor by right any of the divine qualities of immortality, sovereignty, perfect wisdom, goodness, or purity. The Jehovah's Witnesses have borrowed much of their heresy from these early Arian abominations. Thankfully, all of their arguments were anticipated and answered more than 16 centuries ago. More importantly, the scriptures plainly declare and reveal that the Holy Spirit is indeed a person. Another group called the Jesus Only Sect doesn't deny the personality of the Holy Spirit, but does deny that he is a distinct person within the Godhead. This sect is quite strong in the southern part of the United States and has spread as far west as Arizona. Its heresy is not Arianism, but Sabellianism, which denies the separate persons of the Godhead. The Jesus Only sect insists that Jesus is the only God. He is the Father. He is the Son. He is the Holy Spirit. It teaches that the three personalities of God are in reality only three masks that are that the one God wears. But the Bible will have none of this. It clearly and firmly teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person, the same in essence as the Father and the Son, yet separate in personality from them both. When you allow God to teach you, you may be taken on wide varieties of experiences as you go through life, as you learn to study the scriptures, as you learn how to examine truth from truth, because both could be true and accurate according to the wisdom that you have at the time. But as you begin to become older and wiser, as the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom becomes a part of your life by way of the Holy Spirit revealing, then you recognize what the purpose of the word does, the purpose of why the scriptures are written. Then you can see whenever there's an error what it points to and if you extended it outward, if it points to the wrong end, you know it's an error, it's a fallacy, it's a bad idea going in the wrong direction. And if you went down a shortcut, you would recognize that too because as you went farther down the road, when it started off as a four-lane highway and started getting smaller and smaller and smaller to where it was just a little trail, you'd probably think that, you know what, this might not be the freeway I was supposed to follow. This might not be the path I was supposed to take. As a matter of fact, when you reach the dead end, you'd say, uh, it doesn't look right. And it isn't because you extended it all the way to the end. That in and of itself, Jesus said, would be a way to manifest some of the error that comes out of many Christian denominations and teachings that are out there. All you need to do is extend it to its logical end based upon just that point that they start from. Point it all the way out. If the Holy Spirit is not a person, what are you going to do in the end with when you meet him or when you discover as you uncover the rest of scripture in the volume of the book? For as you add all the scriptures together, the pieces have to fit. Jesus said from beginning to end, he was the Alpha and the Omega. He was the beginning and the end. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. The volume, not the individual aspects or parts. It is the entirety of the Word of God that Jesus is. Jesus is the revealed Word of God, personally, from cover to cover. Every part from Genesis, every part all the way through to Revelation. Now people will argue and say, well, you know, I don't like this part, so you know, I'm going to say that that's not inspired. Well, the original text was inspired, but that not English part. No, this, this part that's in Spanish isn't inspired, but this part that's French is good. You know, that German part isn't good, but we're going to go back to this, you know, uh, Aramaic part, you know, or we're going to get over here, you know, we're going to go into the Greek, you know, but we're going to ignore the Koinea Greek, we're going to use this other Greek. Right. Let me tell you something clearly, directly from the Holy Spirit himself. Uh-uh. Whatever you got, you get by way of the Holy Spirit connecting the dots. Let's just say that you have these synopses in your brain, you know, that there's a chemical in between that causes the electricity to jump back and forth. Well, the same thing is true in the way of the spiritual realm. 
There is something that happens between the soul and the spirit and the body and the flesh. Somewhere in there you are taking input. As soon as it gets into the soul, then there is a boundary that it can't get past the soul in order to make a connection spiritual truth. What it does is that as soon as that boundary is removed, there has to be some type of communicative chemical in between that causes this connection from the soul synopsis to the spirit synopsis to make that spark go across, to make that connection or that dot. And the way that that works is the Holy Spirit himself. He has to connect the dots. Just like when you have a chemical imbalance in your brain and the, the synopsis aren't connecting, they're not, the, the little neurons aren't firing back and forth or they might fire crosswise, you know, they don't meet in the right place. So you have people with kind of like, you know, distorted thoughts and weird ideas, you know, and they hear voices that aren't there, you know, and, and I don't mean demon possessed, but I meant just from physical chemical imbalances. And that if you restore the chemical imbalances in the brain, they're fine because everything's firing off right. The same thing is true about the spiritual realm. That's what's true about a spiritual being. You see, everything that's physical in your body also matches you soulfully and matches you spiritually. Now, that could be debatable to some people, but frankly, just look at the plants. If you've got roots, stem, and flower, hey, get real. Come on now. Add the dots. If Jesus himself had body, soul, and spirit, you don't need to figure it out too much. It connects. Likewise, by way of as you learn, God connects those dots so that you can find the reality of the truth that he has given from the beginning of the world for all of us to know because he never said we would lack wisdom. He said, ask me and I'll give you wisdom. All you need to do is ask God who would give us the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and make the connections. If you don't, you won't because you'll always be using intellect as far as your intelligence is concerned without inspiration. You see, there are three that bear witness. There will be intellect, intelligence, and inspiration. Because intelligence is just simply taking in information without knowledge or knowledge without wisdom. And you have to make an application of the reality of experience on the application of knowledge for it to become wisdom. Tripartite. There's always a three-part step to everything that exists within the physical, the emotional, or if you want to say the soulful, and the spiritual. So in the same way, in the spiritual realm, there's three partites that need to be applied whenever you're studying the scriptures. Whether you know they exist or not, eh, that's a level of your understanding and God's revelation to you. But the point is, is that the Holy Spirit can simply talk to you. You may call him Jesus and he'll say, okay, and he'll accept that. You may call him God and he'll say, okay, and he'll accept that. You may call him Spirit and he'll say, okay, and accept that. Because you see, the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself, but he will point to Jesus. Everything that he does, the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of hmm, all the things that he is, all seven spirits that, or all seven aspects of the spirit that he is, will be made manifest in you as you walk with God and talk with Him and then He, the Holy Spirit, reveals to you for your eyesight to see and your ears to hear the Son as He speaks to us from the Father and as the Father speaks to us through the Son so that we would hear, we would know and we would understand what it is that the Spirit says. For without that, we really are kind of like creating our own image of God as opposed to dealing with the interaction of God. And that's the biggest difference that there is. You don't want an image of God that you've made out of religion. You want an interaction with God that's caused by relationship. So as you have a personal relationship with Jesus, he said he would give us the Holy Spirit or send the Comforter to us, better wording said, that he would send him to us, that he would comfort us and guide us into all truth and that he would be another one likened unto him. And so as we know that, then we recognize it's not so important to focus in on the Spirit of God as it is to focus in on Jesus and let the Spirit inspire us. Because that's what he's here to do. Because that's what I do. And that's what Vidivo is about. And that's what Vidivo Spirit is meant to do as we study the Scriptures by way of the Holy Spirit to inspire you to know God intimately, personally, and to reveal Jesus, his Son. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us your word, you've given us your Son, 
but also you've given us your spirit. And oh God, what a wonder he is, as you have caused him to be so subservient and so gentle, to be so meek, to be so humble, to be that person that we would hardly even notice at all, except were it not for his presence being with us as he reveals Jesus to us. If it were not for his fruit that is in our lives, if it were not for his power that is working through us, then God, we would be astounded at how meek and how sensitive and how gentle the very flower of God, so to speak, the very fruit of God, so to imagine that you really are as you reveal yourself to us by your spirit. Oh God, what a tender heart you really have. And I'm so glad that you've given us your spirit to lead us and to guide us to abide with us and to comfort us. For even as we need him more so in these latter days as people try to deceive us with power and might and with principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places, we have light, we have peace, we have love, we have joy, we have the Holy Spirit. And God, I thank you for it. And I pray a blessing upon those that hear you and know you as your spirit leads them, that you would cause them without measure to grow in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, even as I am.